welcome back. Uh, today, uh, in this lecture, we will continue our discussion with photolithography and most likely this is going to be the last lecture on this topic. So, let us have a quick recap as to what we have uh, talked about so far about photolithography. So, we refer back to this particular movie sequence, uh, where you take essentially a silicon wafer, which is let us say doped with p type, you initially grow the oxide layer, then you coat the photoresist layer, then you place the mask, uh, place it, expose it to the UV light and uh, depending on the tone of the photoresist, there is hardening or degradation, remove the mask, then so, up to this level we have already talked and then comes the uh, stage of developing, okay, which we will sort of start uh, or pick up the discussion from um, this particular topic. And uh, we have talked in the previous lectures up to the level of uh, UV exposure or the exposure and followed by the post exposure baking sequence. So, today we get started from the development and then continue our discussion on the remaining aspects of photolithography. And after we finish, again let me uh, sort of tell you that the picture or the discussions we have had so far on photolithography is something at a very, very preliminary level. It is nowhere even close to the industrial setting, but I am sure with this discussion you at least have some basic idea about how, how the technique or the method works. So, development is the subsequent, uh, next subsequent step which is the process uh, step that follows resist exposure and is done to leave behind the correct resist pattern on the wafer which will serve as the physical mask that covers areas on the wafer that need to be protected for chemical attack during subsequent etching. So, as we have talked about depending on uh, a photoresist, so here this is something you are quite well conversant with. So, this is the mask, this is the photoresist layer. So, depending on the quality of the photoresist, this particular area will either degrade or will cross link and degrade or will cross link and it is. So, the next subsequent step is that you have this silicon wafer, the oxide grown silicon wafer and now you would like to retain, let us say this part has cross linked. So, by the process of development, you would like to remove the photoresist, the parts of photoresist which have not cross linked. Okay. So, this is for, a, for the case for a positive photoresist. So, this step is accomplished by this stage is the, or this process is accomplished by the process of development. Essential idea is that you use a chemical uh, solution or a solvent in which the unexposed or the exposed parts will uh, uh, dissolve, but this cross link part, this part will not dissolve. Depending on the tone of the photoresist, it can be the opposite also. So, here you have a, so let us say this is the mask this part the light could not cross, this part the light has crossed. So, for a positive resist, this, these, these are the parts which has degraded. Uh, in a, if you have a negative resist, then well these are the parts upon expose, exposure, these are the parts that will sort of cross link. So, <clears throat> in case of a positive resist, you want the UV exposed or the degraded part to sort of dissolve away. In case of a negative resist, you would like to dissolve away the unexposed part. So, obviously, the, the first thing that emerges out from this discussion is that uh, every specific photoresist has its own developer solution. I mean, this is a very tricky solvent because after all you are washing or dissolving the same chemical. So, composition wise is the same photoresist here and here, but only due to the optical exposure there is certain specific changes in the property. And uh, so, the <coughs> uh, solubility uh, of uh, this developer of this, this photoresist layer in this developer is critical uh, for performing the development uh, in, a, in a desired fashion. Uh, the development process involves chemical reaction wherein unprotected parts of the resist get dissolved 
as I have already told. A good development process has a short duration less than a minute typically, results in minimum pattern distortion or swelling, keeps the original film thickness of the protected areas intact and recreates the intended pattern faithfully. Now, this uh, short duration is very, very critical from the standpoint of development because if you have a longer duration, even the parts which are not, which you do not want really to dissolve will sort of start dissolving because after all do not forget you are using a solvent uh, which uh, is indeed a solvent for the entire material, only parts of the material due to the UV exposure or optical exposure has undergone some changes in the property and therefore, you do not want those areas uh, to sort of dissolve away to achieve your desired structure. So, development is carried out either by immersion developing, spray developing or puddle developing, it is, uh, it is always followed by th uh, thorough rinsing and drying to ensure that the development action will not continue after the developer has been removed from the wafer surface. So, this is very, very important right after development uh, the, the uh, pattern wafer now, now you have a wafer which contains the pattern on the photoresist layer. It is very important that uh, right after development the, the um, pattern wafer is uh, dried because if you do not dry it thoroughly, uh, then some amount of developer solution or some remnant solution will remain uh, on the wafer or on the structures. And uh, so, even after taking it out from the immersion bath for example, the remnant or the trapped uh, or the residual develop, uh, develop a solution that remains within the solution will continue with the develop, so called development or dissolution process, which will damage the fidelity of the structure or the uh, Industrially often a spin developer is used, uh, which uses a spin coater platform to develop. So, essentially uh, the same platform which you have used for uh, coating of the photoresist layer can also be used for development, you uh, instead of the polymer solution. Now, on this exposed uh, silicon wafer, you essentially dispense the developer solution and spin coat it and by the action we have discussed in details about the spin coating. Uh, so, what happens is during the uh, centripetal force induced flow of the uh, developer solution or the solution on the spin coater platform, it sort of washes away the parts it is desired to dissolve. Uh, and then subsequently it, it, it is followed by a drying sequence. Because in immersion what happens is it, is, it often becomes very difficult to control um, the sort of dissolution of parts which are not desired to be dissolved, uh, that, that becomes a problem. So, and, and again then you dip it, then you take it out and then you dry. So, if you have a process like that in, in, in between, it is sort of, uh, it is difficult to sustain in a continuous mode. So, more and more industry, industries are sort of shifting to the spin coder platform for development, which is often referred to as the spin development process. So, here again is a quick recap of what we just discussed. Developer solvent dissolves the softened part of the photoresist, transfer the pattern from mask or reticle to the photoresist and three basic steps are there, development, rinse and dry. Uh, so, here uh, this particular slide sort of gives you a quick idea about the intercorrelation between exposure, the appropriate exposure and the development times, uh, because during exposure also we have discussed. So, this is let us say we have a uh, photoresist layer and you are, ex so suppose you have a mask over here. So, this is the part over which you do not want your light to pass or you want the blinding effect. So, the UV light is actually penetrating within the photoresist layer. Now, one of the critical things to ensure is that the light, uh, the exposure profile within the film uh, uh, sort of uh, goes right into the or along the depth of the photoresist layer. In other words, there is a possibility, let us say this is another case where we have a uh, photoresist layer and you have the same mask. Uh, there is a possibility, there are a couple of possibilities. Firstly, you might have a profile like this of the light or the exposed parts. So, in that case, though you desire to have a structure like this, you will eventually result in a structure like this. The other possibility is that uh, this 
does not penetrate or with the, with the film thickness somehow the intensity of the light becomes weak and so the these parts are subjected to proper development while over these areas the development is not fully complete. So, what will happen depending on the when you want to wash in, in the developer solution, the parts which are properly developed will sort of wash away and these parts will not try to dislodge. So, this might actually lead to a structure which has twofold defect. Suppose this is the desired height you want H0 ideally corresponds to the uh, thickness of the photoresist layer. So, you might have some structure in this particular case uh, where the height might be less than the desired height. Also, uh, you might not see a very smooth surface over here because part of it uh, might have uh, developed uh, properly, part of it might be underdeveloped and things like that. So, these are this is uh, so in, in addition uh, simultaneously, simultaneously along with development you also have to worry about the along with the expo exposure you also need to worry about the uh, development process. So, these two sort of work in conjugation or work in tandem to achieve the uh, desired structure you want. So, an optimum, so a desired high fidelity structure like this one, let us say is only possible when you have the optimum exposure as well as optimum development. So, this particular uh, slide gives you an idea. Uh, so, if you have a high dosage that is the exposure is high and the developer is low, weakly improperly developed, then you tend to get a structure like this. So, the dosage is high and the development is low. So, you might actually get a structure like this. Uh, when you have the both of them are in, in the appropriate proportion or in the optimum proportion, you, you get the desired structure. And this is what is known as the undercut structure we what we just talked, where the exposure or the dosage is low and the developer is dominant. So, dosage is low. So, that is why with the depth somehow the light has not uh, been able to sort of uh, follow this uh, interface sharply and it has sort of become weaker and uh, has led to improper exposure. So, it is important to realize that the exposure and the development process sort of uh, are sort of in a, in a very work in a very, very complementary fashion. Now, development is followed by, so that is uh, the brief discussion we wanted to have about development. In the lab scale of course, you typically go in for an immersion development that is uh, routinely what is used. So, the development process is followed by the process of hard bake. Now, hard bake is performed after exposure at temperature slightly higher than the post exposure bake. Typical temperature can vary from 130 to 150 degree centigrade and time roughly 1 to 3 minutes. The key feature of this step is evaporating all solvents in photoresist, improving the H and Implantation resistance improves photoresist adhesion with the surface, polymerize and stabilize the photoresist and PR flow, uh, the photoresist flow to fill the pinhole. Now, the last stage, so after you have obtained your uh, structures, on the photo resist layer. So, this is post development photoresist structure. Now, what we want to do now, we our final intention is to transform this topographic structure on the photoresist layer, which do not forget is actually a reflection of the structure you had on the mask. So, on the mask you nearly had a uh, chemical structure or, or sort of uh, you, you had, if you remember about the mask you had a chrome layer and part of it was stripped off. So, it was more of a 2D structure, there was variation. Uh, so, these parts were covered by the absorbing light, let us say uh, over these areas the light was allowed to sort of pass. And so, the, the structure on the mask now you have got it converted onto the photoresist layer 
An essential idea is that following the same pattern, you would finally, so this is finally what we want to create, we would be interesting in creating, let us say if it is a p type wafer, we will be interested in creating domains of or n type domains within that p type wafer. Okay. So, in order to have that, what are the rem remaining steps? The remaining steps is first you need to sort of remove this oxide layer along the photoresist structures. So, your next stage is, okay, I will just draw it again. So, this is your developed wafer. you still have a intact oxide layer on the silicon. Your next desired step will be to remove the oxide layer over these areas. Okay. And this is achieved by the process of etching. Okay. Uh, so, what you have done now? You have actually uh, transformed the mask pattern to initially to the photoresist layer and then the same pattern what you have on the photoresist layer has now been transferred, transferred into the oxide layer. So, how is it done? Exactly like the stage of development where you had a layer of photoresist having special variation in their chemical composition due to the opti due to sort of uh, special variation in UV light exposure uh, controlled by the mask, you sort of uh, immersed it or applied the developer solution which preferentially removed parts of the photoresist uh, or the exposed photoresist film depending on its chemical properties. So, this is what you did as a part of development. right? Now, you essentially want to do the same thing. Instead of your change in the chemical properties in a in the developed uh, or, or in the exposed uh, photoresist film, what you want here is that you want to remove away parts of the oxide layer which are not covered by the photoresist or uh, the pattern photoresist areas. Okay. So, essential idea is that now again you apply some sort of a solvent which uh, will remove the parts of the oxide layer which you sort of artificially grew during the growth of the barrier layer. Uh, wherever the solution has access to the oxide layer. Okay. So, if you now immerse this whole structure in a solution, what will happen over these areas, the solution does not have access to the oxide layer. Okay. However, over these, over the areas where there is no photoresist uh, structure, the solution has direct access to the uh, oxide layer and you have to use a material or a solution which then dissolves the oxide layer preferentially. So, eventually the oxide layer below the photoresist structures remain uh, undisturbed or unperturbed while the oxide layer which were over the areas above which there was no photoresist coating gets washed away. So, all this gets washed away in the etch during the process of etching. So, this is what your etching uh, sequence or etching process does. It transforms the topographic structure you have created post development on the photoresist film now gets transferred preferentially transferred onto the barrier layer or the oxide film. So, 
the previous step produces a pattern in the photoresist layer coating the uh, coating the oxide oxidized wafer this pattern photoresist will now be used for selectively etching the oxide areas that are exposed as we have already told uh, the pattern coated wafer is placed in typically hydrofluoric acid uh, is used as an etching solution hf bath to remove the exposed oxide hf will react chemically with the oxide to form water soluble products that dissolve in the water used to dilute the acid. Uh, when the oxide is etched away, the silicon beneath the oxide layer can be seen. Uh, HF does not attack the silicon, so this remains uh, sort of unperturbed and you now have access to the silicon which, which let us say has a specific type of a doping and uh, then all you need to do is that you need to again expose this structured thing into an environment where there is a reaction uh, with the let us say there are some gas phase reactants which react with the p type wafer creating uh, n type domains over these areas where you do not have a uh, these uh, photoresistant combined photoresistant oxide structures. But the issue is that the doping reactions are pretty harsh, uh, the conditions are pretty harsh and so if you have the photoresist layer present during the doping reaction, uh, there are every possibility, there is every possibility that the during the doping reaction, the reactants will also react with the photoresist layer or the remnant parts of the photoresist structures and that will contaminate the doping sequence. So, the next step before doping is performed is to now wash away or dissolve away the hardened photoresist layers itself. So, this is important and tricky or uh, in a way important to understand that in the process of development you uh, depending on of course, on the tone of the photoresist, you had preferentially removed the areas of the photoresist which are which have either gone which have either degraded due to UV exposure or the areas uh, if you are using a negative photoresist for example, you have removed the areas which remain unaltered uh, by uh, not getting exposed to UV. Okay? So, part of the so the development uh, so uh, in, in, in other words. Uh, to the development solution or to the developer solution, uh, this uh, change in the chemical property within the photoresist layer after exposure was important. So, the developer solution was strong enough to dissolve parts of the photoresist layer that was in that is intended to be removed and it was weak enough not to affect or not to dissolve parts of the photoresist layer which can either be physically cross linked or which has not degraded, uh, which has either not degraded or has uh, uh, not physically cross linked uh, depending on the tone of the photoresist. So, the developer solution did not affect or dissolve those parts of the uh, photoresist film, but in this uh, stage what you want to do the part of the photoresist layer which sort of uh, could uh, uh, sustain the developer solution during the process of development itself is now removed away. So, after this particular stage uh, what you are left with uh, is the structured the structured burial layer nothing else remains. So, the entire the all the photoresist is now gone and uh, you are left with the structured barrier or, or silicon oxide or the oxide layer on a exposed silicon. Uh, this particular step of remove these uh, portions of the hardened photoresist uh, structures is known as the method of uh, the process of ashing. It is the last stage of photolithography. This process has the exposed wafer spread with a mixture of organic solvents that dissolve portions of the photoresist. Uh, conventional methods of ashing require an oxygen plasma ash often in combination with halogen gases to penetrate the crust and remove the entire photoresist. Because do not forget this photoresist is sort of chemically stiffened or hardened and has not dissolved in the developer solution. So, you really need uh, some really 
uh, strong uh, chemicals to remove it. Uh, and the plasma ashing process also require a follow up cleaning with wet chemicals and acids to remove the residual and non volatile contaminants that remain after ashing because most important is no part of the dissolved photoresist, photoresist layer should actually go and block these areas because uh, then your entire concept or your entire objective of the uh, photoresist process, uh, the photolithography process is uh, lost. Okay? Uh, so, despite this uh, treatment, it is not unusual to repeat the ash plus wet clean cycle in order to completely remove all photoresist and residues. It is extremely important that no residual or remnant photoresist remains at the stage where you finally have a structured wafer. Now, the structure is only on the oxide layer and you are now going to subject that to the final reaction which will create domains, let us say n type domains over areas where there is no burial layer. So, this is the final objective. And then that is what is the final step is the dopant diffusion, uh, n type silicon wafer is brought into contact with the p type silicon uh, current. So, you know this. So, this process, this I am not going into the details, I am skipping that details. The final thing, the final step will be the step of dopant diffusion. So, that essentially uh, would create a p type, uh, if you have a p type silicon wafer. So, there will be some chemical reaction, surface reaction here, which will create n type domains over here. And once that is accomplished, your next, uh, so after the dopant diffusion step, you will now have a silicon which initially you had taken let us say having only one type of doping after the dopant diffusion step you now have domains of other type of doping in a let us say wafer matrix. So, our intention as we had initially pointed out, each one now acts as a p n junction. Okay. So, this is, I will just have a quick recap of what we discussed today. So, you take a mask, you then uh, expose it. So, you after performing the exposure, you are here, you have a photoresist layer, which now has specially varying chemical properties. Uh, the spatial variation is sort of in phase with the mask patterns. Then you develop it. So, you remove part of the photoresist layer and create a structured photoresist film. Okay. So, you had initially had a flat photoresist film and now part of it has been washed away to have structured photoresist film. Now, uh, from the standpoint of microelectronics, what we are saying is all the way important. So, you, you sort of uh, uh, get the structured photoresist film, then you uh, uh, do the etching, then you do the ashing and then you do the uh, sort of the dopant diffusion. However, in various other branches of science, uh, for example, if you are uh, trying to fabricate some microfluidic channels or some templates for uh, studying structural superhydrophobicity, something we have already talked about, in uh, there are can be many, many settings in which you go only up to this level. You, you would be happy to have the final structures on your photoresist layer itself. Okay? Because these, uh, we, let us say depending on the pattern or structure you had on the mask, you have been successfully able to transfer that structure onto the photoresist layer and you, you want to sort of uh, make uh, uh, further patterns or further experiments on this type of structure itself. However, if you are talking about the full, uh, the complete photolithographic process as it is required in the microelectronic industry, you subsequently go to the stage of etching, 
where you remove the oxide layer uh, following the photoresist structure what you have. Once the etching is over, so after etching you create a structure like this, you have a pattern, uh, you have a, uh, you have patterns present on the silicon wafer. Now each of the pattern pillar or stripe now is a composite structure comprising of a photoresist top and a oxide bottom. In the next stage is uh, ashing. In the ashing stage, you get rid of the photoresist layers. So now again you have a structured uh, surface, but the structures now comprises of uh, only oxide, the structured oxide layer or the structures are made up of silicon oxide which are standing on the uh, silicon and then you go in for the dopant diffusion and then if you are talking about microelectronic application, your final step would involve removing the remnant oxide structures altogether. So finally, you will get back again a flat silicon wafer Finally, you get back a flat silicon wafer, but and uh, do not forget that you had started off also with a flat silicon wafer, but only difference you might understand is that you had started off with a entirely p typed doped wafer and what you now have is distinct n doped domains. So, each one of the junction sort of acts as p n junction. So, this is in a nutshell what we wanted to discuss or the concept I wanted to give you as a part of discourse on uh, photolithography. I think if you do a little bit of literature search uh, coupled with and uh, see these lectures a uh, couple of times, uh, the concept will be clear to you. We get back to the movie or uh, the movie sequence or the uh, we had been showing uh, from the beginning. So, let us have a look now whether you understand. Uh, all the steps. So, you get started with a p type silicon wafer substrate uh, which uh, is here as we have uh, talked and then uh, you then subsequently deposit the barrier layer or the oxide layer. You apply the photoresist by spin coating, you do a soft bake to remove the solvent, you make a mask somewhere and then align the mask. Uh, using the exposure mechanisms we have already talked. Then you expose it to UV to, to uh, achieve the exposure step. Then you do the development, the hard bake, the H, the resist strip of the ashing and then the dopant diffusion reaction. So, let us have a look now quickly and I think uh, each uh, step will now make sense to you. So, you start off with a silicon wafer substrate, you grow the oxide layer, you apply the photoresist by spin coating, you bring in the mask containing the desired structure, you place the mask depending on what uh, uh, mechanism you want to use, you expose it to UV depending on the photoresist tone, there will be special variation in the chemical property within the photoresist layer, the mask is lifted off, now you develop So, part of the photoresist layer is now gone, you have been able to successfully transfer the mask pattern onto the photoresist layer, you do the etching, so that will remove the part of the oxide layer also uh, which will follow the topography of the uh, photoresist layer. And then after that, this is what we discussed in this particular class. So, between this step and this step is essentially this uh, uh, where you have a, uh, so the structure on the photoresist layer gets transferred onto the oxide layer and the, the, the oxide layer is also removed because of the etching and after the oxi oxide layer is removed, we talk about the process of ashing which you can see here. Uh, here. So, here now the photoresist layer is gone, uh, you, you, you are left with the structure on the uh, oxide layer only and then you do the dopant diffusion. So, only the part of the uh, wafer that is not covered by the uh, barrier layer 
is sort of undergoes this diffusion or an n type domain uh, is created and in the fi final step you also remove the oxide layer. And so eventually you get to what we had talked about, you get back a flat silicon wafer, but which contains distinct n type domains as per your structure or the structure you had created on, on the mask. So, this is uh, this sort of concludes our uh, discussion on photolithography what we wanted to discuss so far, but uh, I will. Uh, so, th there are some key requirements of lithography for manufacturing of integrated circuits, critical dimension control, overlay, defect control and as much as cost effective you can make it, because 30 to 40 percent of the total semiconductor industry cost is due to the process of lithography. Now, after this we will uh, uh, discuss some uh, novel aspects of photolithography, which are more of uh, associated with creative fun, but uh, they hardly are applied presently at the industrial level, but uh, they have some potential and they are at the research level. So, let us have a quick look at three of the topics I have earmarked and have a short discussion. Firstly, the colloidal mask, second is the micro lens array and third is the ma maskless lithography. Now, by now you also understand alongside uh, critical issues like uh, let us say mask alignment and things like that, one of the major uh, difficult thing to uh, obtain or one of the most costly or, or a uh, uh, major uh, component of uh, for the successful uh, completion of the photolithography process is to obtain the desired mask. So, uh, which uh, again you, you take a layer of a quartz glass, let us say coat it with chromium and then preferentially strip off parts of it and this has to be done by some direct right methods like electron beam lithography or focused ion beam. You can just do a uh, literature search with these keywords, which again is an extremely uh, costly uh, method and uh, uh, these are direct write methods, these are not uh, parallel methods, uh, serial, they are very, very time consuming slow, etcetera, etcetera. So, there has been uh, uh, some focus to sort of can we create and of course, the other thing is that once you create a specific mask, you cannot change its design. If you really want to create a new design, you need to have a new mask. So, there has been thoughts of uh, can we somehow make reconfigurable masks and things like that. And one of the things that people um, are working with is the so called the concept of uh, colloidal crystals. Now, I, this also goes by the name nanosphere lithography, this process itself goes by the name nanosphere lithography. It is a very simple concept. If you have some small spherical particles, let us say of silica or something, these are colloidal particles dispersed in a solvent and you apply a drop of that uh, dispersion on a solid surface and sort of do a controlled evaporation. Under many circumstances, you can actually lead to a layer of these particles nicely ordered in the surface with an hexagonal close pack structure. This happens due to the uh, uh, interaction within the particles and it, as it turns out that uh, uh, the a, a hexagonal close pack structure corresponds to the minimum energy configuration. We might be taking up this issue later at this uh, in this course later part of this course, but for the time being you have to believe me that if you if you sort of allow the particles to evaporate if the particles are mono dispersed that is the particles have uh, roughly the same size, uh, it is possible to create structures with a, a hexagonal. Uh, close pack structures. So, it is like this. Now, this is sorry for the bad drawing, it is easier said than done that the, the nanosphere lithography as it is called itself is a is a is a, a major area of research and has been receiving significant recent attention, but uh, one can. So, I, I will uh, skip the details this is of, of an achieved. So, as the solvent evaporates capillary forces draw the nanospheres of the particles together and the, the spheres crystallize into a hexagonally close pack pattern on the substrate. There are some nitty gritty details uh, which one needs to sort of work out uh, to have a single layer coverage. So, this happens this hexagonal closed structure occurs if you have particles 
sort of arranged as a single layer on the solid surface, which is uh, difficult to achieve, but it can be done under certain specific condition. We are skipping that details for the time being. So, here uh, you can see that it, it becomes possible to create an hexagonal closed pack structure like this. Uh, there, there will be, there in most experimental cases, there are some defects along these structures, but those again can be controlled. One can also uh, think of uh, working out techniques, there are techniques people are working on that of making these structures non close back. So, you really do not want the particles to touch each other or the stabilization is taking place due to their steric uh, interaction, but you can tailor the interaction by some other mechanism. Again, something probably I will take up at a later date, but uh, for the time being if you regard that it is possible to uh, make hexagonal close back structures like this. Then you can see that if you have a structure like this, uh, in between areas of this uh, particle, if you look at this particular figure where the mouse is now in detail, uh, the a surface below this array of particles gets exposed only over these areas and is not exposed over other areas. So, now if you have a surface, let us say a photoresist layer and on top of that if you have been able to create an array of these type of particles and then if you expose it to UV light, then what will happen? Only these parts of the surface will be subjected to UV exposure and the other parts there will be no UV exposure because the particles are sitting over there. So, in other words, this particle array now acts as a virtual mask. Okay. So, uh, this is uh, an example from a recent work. So, if you have one layer of particles or uh, one layer of spherical particles, spherical colloidal particles. So, this acts as a virtual mask and if you now expose it, you can create a structure like this. Subsequently, it has to be followed by development and things like that. In contrast, if you have a particle array like this and then you expose it, depending on the uh, quality of uh, the tone of the photoresist layer, you can either create a honeycomb structure like this or you can create a structure like this. Uh, also, uh, one can understand very simply easily that if you uh, have an array of uh, particles like this and change the angle of tilt and you are exposing, exposing from the top, then also depending on that there will be a change in the uh, sort of uh, exposure settings and you can get different type of structures. More interesting thing can occur if you, if you instead of one particle layer, if you can have two particle layer. So, you can immediately understand that uh, if you have a first layer of particles like this, due to the, uh, the curvature effect of the particles and all that, the, the second layer a particle will come and sit over each of these areas. Okay. But eventually it will create a very complicated arrangement, it will create a complicated arrangement and even lesser part of the substrate will remain visible to the exposed uh, UV light and eventually it, you can uh, get some nice uh, nano dots like this upon subsequent uh, exposure. A variety of uh, 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 colloidal particles can be used and it can be also sort of used in conjugation with uh, other properties of polymer like by heating it up beyond the glass transition temperature and one can create uh, nice uh, structure, uh, mushroom structure with overhang like this. These are some of the things we will talk in detail. So, creating this itself is uh, non-trivial. So, here is the idea that you had taken a pattern photoresist layer and uh, uh, or you had taken a pattern layer and then you place uh, glass uh, beads or particles like this and uh, or polystyrene beads, polystyrene particles like beads like this and then you Heat, heat these particles over glass transition temperature. So, it spreads, it melts and spreads over the photoresist layer. And now, if you dissolve the photoresist layer, 
you sort of can get uh, these type of structures, mushroom structures with overhang, which are very, very difficult to uh, obtain otherwise, because uh, conventional photolithography, whatever little you have understood, it will be very difficult to create zones like this, having overhang. So, a lot of activity is going on, I will skip some of the details uh, uh, for the time being. We now come <coughs> to the, the to a, another uh, concept, which is very uh, uh, closely related to this particle array concept, and it also sort of uh, acts as the, uh, I mean, is related to the projection uh, mode of printing. Now, uh, instead of uh, using these particles, each of these particles as a virtual mask, what about you make an array of lenses? Because in projection mode, after all, what you are doing, you are actually using a, a uh, you might be wondering what Dilip Kumar is doing here, but we will uh, come to it very soon. In projection mode, ultimately, you are using a condenser lens to sort of create an image uh, of your mask pattern on the photoresist layer. So, instead, the idea is that instead of using a single lens, if you now have an array of these lenses. So, you here when we talked, we uh, implicitly assumed that these particles, what we had, we were talking about are not transparent to the UV light. So, they were physically blocking the passage of the light, thereby transferring the, uh, allowing uh, parts of the photoresist layer to get, get, get exposed to the UV exposure. However, instead of uh, using opaque particles, if you now use particles which are transparent and each one, it is a spherical particle, so each one can act as a lens. So, the idea is very, very simple. You have one original mask pattern and you now have an array, if you can see in this figure, you now have an array of these lenses. So, what it is going to happen? What it is going to happen is that so, this is the original mask pattern and each lens at, at the focal plane is going to create an image. So, you start off with one original pattern and by using, instead of using one lens, but using an array of lenses, micro lenses, you can sort of create an image of the mask pattern at one go. So, you are not relying on, on the step and repeat mechanism, where you expose it once, then the stepper motor comes in, you remove it to the next location and things like that, which we have already discussed, just refer to one of our previous lectures. So, here the advantage is that you start off with one mask pattern and each lens sort of creates an image of it at the, on the photoresist surface and then you can do the exposure and subsequently at one shot or parallel in a, in a parallel sequence, you can create multiple structures. So, ideally, if you want to create an array of this type of a structure. I am not very sure whether you can see it clearly, but these are small f's written on this. Uh, you would like to have a mask also like this, which is prohibitively expensive, which, which will take a lot of time to make, etcetera, etcetera. But here, uh, this uh, micro lens uh, projection lithography gives you the freedom that you create a mask, which has the same structure, but only one, much larger, because you are projecting, so you have the liberty to reduce the size. And each of these micro lens sort of acts uh, uh, or produces one image on the photoresist layer. If uh, this idea is not very clear to you, just have a quick look at this clip from Mughal Azam, a classic uh, movie. It is this concept. So, I will repeat it again. The difference is in this particular sequence, uh, each one is uh, sort of a mirror. So, you see multiple images of the uh, of the dancer or uh, Nurjahan, uh, but uh, if you now think that instead of, uh, so these are sort of micro mirrors, but if you now think that instead of mirrors, you now have an array of lenses. So, what it will do, it will produce or condense uh, this image on a, on the, in this case on the photoresist layer. And uh, so, though you have one 
lady who is dancing, you have multiple images and in principle exactly like what we have shown here, you can starting from one mask pattern, you can produce multiple patterns on your photoresist layer. Okay? So, this is another very uh, novel development that has taken place in the field of uh, photolithography. Uh, this was uh, sort of uh, developed about 6-7 years back, but still in the research level, but has a lot of uh, potential. This is also often referred to as the bagai lens arrangement, because you might be knowing that uh, most insects have a complex eye, where uh, each of these uh, uh, sort of they have uh, multiple lenses unlike uh, our eye where we have one uh, lens arrangement. So, they have multiple lenses. So, that sort of gives them a very wide uh, uh, 360 degree vision uh, at, at times. Okay. Uh, the last uh, thing that again is becoming popular, but still at a research level is the concept of a mask less lithography. Uh, uh, now, unlike a uh, array of micro lens, the maskless lithography uses uh, an array of micro mirrors. So, you have a array of micro mirrors. This is a very recent development, a company in California makes it. A couple of such instruments are available already in the market. So, you have uh, an array of micro lenses. Often, this array matches the resolution of your desktop monitor. And the uh, crux is that each of this micro, uh, I am sorry, it is not an array of micro lens, it is an array of micro mirrors. So, each of these mirrors, let us say we are now considering one mirror, each of this mirror can sort of, so this is the, uh, let us say the reflecting face. Each of this mirror can be turned on or off. So, let us say, let us say this is the on position and if you sort of have it in this position, it can be a simple swivel arrangement also, it is off. So, now imagine that you have created a drawing or a structure on your computer monitor. So, ideal arrangement is you have an UV source here, you keep your photoresist film here, the light falls on the mirror, gets reflected and I have deliberately drawn it at this 45 degree angle, because that is how it works. So, light uh, falls on this array of mirror, gets reflected and uh, the photoresist gear layer gets illuminated. So, the key difference is that unlike uh, in all other previous mechanism or uh, uh, methods, where you have a direct exposure of the photoresist layer, here you sort of use this 45 degree arrangement uh, with this array of uh, micro mirrors. Now, suppose you have created a design, what you want to reproduce on your photoresist uh, film. And somehow, following that design, you turn off some of the mirrors. Okay. So, let us say corresponding to this design, some of the mirrors are turned off. So, what is going to happen? The UV light is falling on this mirror array altogether, but it gets reflected from the mirrors which are turned on. So, corresponding to these mirrors or areas over these mirrors, no light is coming to the photoresist layer. So, what happens? If you now look at the photoresist film, it is not getting fully exposed uh, by the UV light, but part of it, it, there is no light. So, it gets exposed only over these areas and the mirrors which are turned off corresponding to that, there is uh, no UV exposure. So, this mirror array or the configured mirror array uh, following the uh, pattern you want to create uh, acts as a virtual mask. And the advantage is that these mirrors are reconfigurable, reusable. So, every design you want to sort of use, the mirror array can be reconfigured. Uh, it is actually com computer controlled, very simple. So, depending on the design you want to create, uh, the, it automatically changes, the, these mirrors automatically change uh, to either to turn on and turn off position. So, this is a very novel development, still it has its own, uh, still at the lab scale firstly, it has its own limitation, lateral resolution is roughly 1 micron to 3 micron, but the biggest advantage is that uh, this uh, use of this uh, micro uh, mirror array uh, sort of uh, is one of the 
first major developments which uh, removes the uh, necessity of a mask and this array uh, or the micro mirror array control micro mirror array acts as a virtual mask which can be uh, sort of configured which configures itself depending on the design it's a it's a very uh, novel development and for many many techniques or processes uh, at the lab scale where you want to have different structures this can be a very very uh, good development so with that we conclude our discussion on photolithography i hope you have now have some idea on what is the process of photolithography we have had some critical discussion on the major components of photolithography i would request you to consult some textbook or look at the wikipedia along with these lecture notes and uh, i am sure you will have some uh, reasonable amount of understanding of the process of photolithography whatever is necessary from the standpoint of a uh, person who is a non uh, uh, sort of uh, who is not into the hardcore i see chip making but one needs to have some idea about how patterning uh, is achieved i also talked about some of the recent developments which are still at the research level which are augmenting well with photolithography to come up with novel concepts like microlens array and uh, maskless lithography